So um, I'm going to ask him to start off the panel um, with just some thoughts, um, you know, about what he's heard from the various panels and what the implications are for um, superintendents and for people in the schools uh, trying to implement this information. While, while we're waiting for him to come back, um, and because uh, we really want to hear from him, um, I want to throw out a question to um, the, the uh, three panelists and then we'll get his reaction. Um, <clears throat> there's been a lot of talk about the need for cleaning and disinfecting, and uh, we need both, and it's not one or, it's not one or the other, um, and um, how we might do it safely. So sh should children be involved in cleaning their desks or disinfecting their desks? Um, and what kinds of things, knowing how difficult it is for getting supplies in some places, what, how do teachers know what might be safe to have in the classroom if they are going to encourage um, the children or the students be engaged? Okay. So I think Tracy's ready and Claire. Mm -hmm. So I'll start out and Claire, you can back clean up. How's that? That's uh, <laughs> Sure. We're, we're both like wiggling in our seats on this one. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> so. While I while I recognize that the temptation is there, so so there are certain things that I think that you should definitely be getting, you know, students and um, and other staff involved in, like clutter control in the classroom, um, making sure that the ventilators who are, that the, that the ventilation system that's delivering air to your room is unimpeded, um, that rooms are actually cleanable by staff, right? And with that, your custodial staff based on a larger on a larger plan should be the ones who are identifying the products identifying the policies and the practices and teachers and everyone else should be following that established plan so one of the issues that we have had you know kind of continuously is folks with the best of intentions with the absolute best of intentions bringing in products from home, bringing in products that are not um, uh, approved by the district. So first of all, you really do need to work on having a district plan for um, what your cleaning practice is and disinfecting practice is going to be, what those, um, what those products are going to be that especially that um, that if they are that you're disinfecting and your products are third party certified if they were to be um, to be the the healthiest and, and the and the safest products that you can be using and those are the products that should be used right and I'm I it, it, it gives me the hives to you know when I think about you, know, you even if you could get your hands on a Lysol wipe sticking it in the hand of a of an elementary school student and having them use that kind of like kind of willy-nilly so I really I'm just determined to help spread the message that you know a you know this is you know, uh, a virus that we have recognized is very susceptible to soap and water cleaning. Yes, there are going to be areas that need to be, you know, disinfected, but that needs to be part of a larger strategy that is created with intent and executed in that way as well. So there are certainly things that, that students can and staff can help with, and there are others that really need to be left to your to your professional staff. And you know, disinfecting is something that we are we are not. I I, I I am not in favor of putting in the hands of children, especially. But um, but even other, you know, it, 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 and if it is other staff, then it certainly needs to be through an established plan and program of that school and school district. Thank you, Claire. Do you want to add to that? And Claire, anything to add to that? Oh. Um, Did you put it? Are you? Oh, she, she can't hear us. So it's, you might want to just chatter and see if maybe she's if she's uh, got her. Does she have um earphones or anything plugged into her sound? No, I don't know. She's not on mute. Yes, well, um, okay. Well, I think um, yeah. We'll we'll go ahead. Um, uh, and Dr. Gerbo, there have been a lot of um, questions about um, 
various uh, things like hydrogen peroxide. What about um, uh, air purifiers or UV? Um, does your research, have you gotten specific on COVID? Um, does it, is it, uh, I know you've done a lot of stuff with, with other types of um, pathogens and microorganisms. So um, if you could uh, perhaps address some of those questions. Yeah, I think there are a lot of products available, but like we just heard, that really should be up to the professional staff and janitor crews because, uh, and, and custodial crews and that. And I think a district plan, I think I heard, w was really a good idea. And that's what you really need to do because you want to make sure you're selecting the correct products with the minimal risk to the students. And, and, and it should be, really, I look at the custodial craft as the professionals that and their, their their managers to develop the plan and select the, the proper strategy in that. Because you have to make sure you're using the, the right products in the right places at the right time uh, and minimizing uh, the, 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 the exposure to the students and that. So I, I think that's that's ideal, but it's really a professional thing. I, I agree, I'm not really in, in favor of students bringing their own things in and that. And there, also, there's a lot of new tools that can be used uh, Someone mentioned electrostatic sprayers, which allow you to cover a large area in more rapid time. One of the big challenges in custodial crews is trying to disinfect surfaces on a regular basis and maintain that. And there are new tools like electrostatic sprayers, that, but they can only be used professionally um, in, in disinfecting wipes. So I, I think it's uh, really important that it, it be in the hands of the a district really decides what they're tools are going to be and what they're going to do. There are a number of products available. Uh, quad air ammonia compounds are, are probably the ones most commonly used or what we call quads, like, you know, Lysol would be an example of one of those, but there are hydrogen peroxide and otherwise, but I think that really has to be up to a district decision. What's the most uh, useful and what's the most available today uh, for achieving uh, and reducing the amount of risk uh, to the students and the, and the staff and, and, and the teachers. I wanted to say uh, specifically around disinfecting wipes. Those are antimicrobial pesticides and every container is marked not for the use by children. So children do not handle disinfecting wipes, period. Um, and that's, the, so always follow the directions with disinfectants. They are dangerous products. I will say that both leach and quaternary ammonia products um, both of which work against the coronavirus, but there are many other disinfectants that do as well. Quats and bleach are asthmagens. Those are chemicals that will cause or trigger asthma. So it gets back really to a supply chain issue. And the supply chain is, can you find sufficient uh, cleaning products and disinfecting products uh, to address what's, what, what the school is going to need long term? Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention about, um, about this is that in the beginning of our presentation, I talked a little bit about priority, you know, doing a building walkthrough right now during the summer, walk around the outside, walk around the inside, prioritize the needs for maintenance and repairs, and fix the things that are really critical uh, right now. But, you know, the, the world is anticipating most people are anticipating, most organizations in the K-12 constituency groups are anticipating that there will be school closures. They will re schools will reopen, but it will be like rolling brownouts. There will be periods where buildings are going to be closed. What we do say, and we really stress this in our report, is that that unexpected closure time is a great time to work on the building to improve the building. It is very, very difficult to work on fully occupied buildings, to work on the ventilation system, work on the lighting, work on deep cleaning, do all those kind of minor maintenance and repair things while well, school's fully loaded with kids and, and adults. So be prepared to have that checklist of priority needs of maintenance and repair and use your downtime, that unexpected closure time is, how regardless of the inconvenience and how difficult it is for the world, it's a great time to work on a building. Thanks. One of the other questions was, um, would face shields, especially for nurses or teachers, be effective instead of wearing masks all day long? You know, we, uh, um, um, when you talk to school unions, their full realization 
that OSHA requires protective gear for employees on the job. And uh, the assumption is that schools will need to provide masks for free to all staff. Um, and there's a certain, uh, we certainly hope that if masks are required for children as well, that uh, schools and parents and PTAs will also be able to provide masks for all children. Face shields are a, a really interesting question. Um, certainly there was a, a comment in the chat box about children who are deaf and are lip reading. You certainly can't do that if you have a mask on, uh, but certainly a face shield would come into play with that. Um, another thing that schools are, are investing in, I think, are the, uh, not the face shield, it's a sneeze guard, um, is a sort of a partition. Uh, and a lot of supermarkets and, uh, these days are using uh, sneeze guards around the checkout counters uh, so that um, uh, you might have a sneeze guard in the reception area, uh, might be one even around a teacher's desk. Um, so uh, there are a number of different um, opportunities to do that work. On the other hand, everything costs money and schools have taken a real hit. Uh, yeah. So there is a money question here. Yeah, yeah, that is a big question. Um, uh, one of the panelists said face shield should not be used instead of masks. Um, I'm not sure that we, uh, I, I don't know if the data, you know, the research is in, but anyway, it's a question. And so, um, uh, um, I, I can I think the answer is we don't have a specific answer among this group at this point. Um, so um, uh, another question was um, the issue of um, playgrounds, because uh, Dr. Gerber, you mentioned playgrounds as being special, especially uh, vulnerable fomites. Um, and if if they were um, if they were done in cohorts so that only one group of kids went out at a time and there were hand washing, knowing how um, antsy kids are and to keep them cooped up without any opportunities to play all day can be a challenge. Um, do you have any suggestions? <laughs> Dr. Gerba? Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm here. Yeah, actually, uh, we, we've done some studies on playgrounds in uh, how Germany they are, but your, your issue of hand washing, any time a child uses a playground, they, they should hand wash. We've tested children's hands, actually, after being on playgrounds, different age groups, and that it's an interesting, you'll find uh, uh, giardia, which causes diarrhea, you'll find uh, norovirus on their hands, and you'll find, we even found hepatitis A on children's hands after they've been out, out on playgrounds, because they're sharing common uh, play equipment like monkey bars, swings, and that. Uh, actually, it's amazing. You'll find a lot of uh, bird pathogens on monkey bars. Apparently, birds use them as public toilets from what we can see, too. So uh, what I've seen, too, in playgrounds, they'll, you'll have groups of children like a 15-minute break, and then another classroom will come, and one classroom moves through another on the playground. So, I, I, you know, I think at this time, maybe playground access should be limited or uh, or, or practice regular uh, uh, disinfecting on these surfaces is the only other option. But I think the third option too is always making sure kids don't touch their face if they're using it when they come back before they come in the classroom, uh, they wash their hands uh, would be the other option on that because you're sharing very common equipment with a lot of different people in the school. So I, I think that's a, your other option is hand washing anytime the kids are, uh, children are out in, in uh, using facilities are going to be shared by other children. And if I, and I, if I can just add, I think that's so critical, you know, what, uh, what, what Dr. Gerber is saying there. And I think it also speaks to, again, going back to the interrelated nature of what your plan is going to need to look like. I, I so wish that we had a one size fits all plan that we could put out there for every school and school district, but so much of it is going to have to do with every decision that is made in your school has implications. And so when you're deciding about, you know, a, what recess is gonna look like or whether you're gonna provide access to the, to the playground, then what that means in terms of source control when those children come back inside has to, is the now, 
it, that shifts, right? So what they are bringing, what, what they are encountering on that playground, how you are cleaning the playground, certainly, but then also what they're likely to be bringing back into that school setting that you have done so much to try to, you know, to, to try to clean and, and control. So source control becomes really critical there as well. And those kids are sources, um, as well as what's on their shoes and they're tracking and they're bringing in what's on their hands. So it, it, no, there, every decision is a part of that framework that I talked about. You have to run it through that framework and you have to run it through the other technical solutions. Will this have an impact on mold and moisture? Will this have an impact on, uh, on uh, integrated pest management? Will it have an impact on HVAC? So every, there's no single decision, right? Yeah, everything is, is connected there. Um, this is Claire again. I wanted to make a comment about uh, cost um, because what we're really um, uh, what we're really concerned about is that schools are prey very often to marketing problems and disinformation from manufacturers and vendors. Uh, there were we saw lots of pictures in media about broadcast spraying of disinfectants. So I wanted to share something uh, from our report. Uh, we did not develop it, but the uh, Green Seal, the International Eco Laborer did regarding should you use these to disinfect. Um, and this is um, on page 38 of our report. So you heard about EPA has a list called the end list of disinfectants. All those have been uh, certified to are registered because they deal with the coronavirus. Um, so that's a really important piece. Um, let me get back to the screen again. Host is disabled sharing. Thank you. Um, so there are solutions that may not work or are very questionable. And schools need to pay attention to what are questionable solutions. Um, and make sure if it doesn't appear on the EPA end list, it may not be what you want to spend money on. The second thing I wanted to say about uh, funding um, is the House did pass a bill on uh, to call the Rebuild America Schools Act, um, and it is on its way to the Senate. If the Senate were to approve that and put it into motion, it would release about $10 billion in the current FY20 year, that's now, uh, for working on ventilation systems, and that would be a really important step. Um, so we've also uh, been trying very hard to restore and return money to EPA programs, a number of the programs that Tracy has just mentioned. So there are opportunities at the federal level to get some money into what needs to happen in schools, and it's important to remember that because the states are having a very, very difficult time as our communities give the impact economy of the uh, current pandemic. Thanks. Thank you. Um, uh, a question uh, probably for Tracy um, is if you are in a building that either doesn't have opening windows or whose windows don't open, um, you know, what can you do for improving ventilation? Okay. So um, open, having operable windows is not necessarily the, um, the ideal for getting outdoor air because the other thing is, so I, again, you're going to be starting from wherever your school or school district or wherever that particular school is. Okay. So what you want to make sure is when we say outside air, that's not necessarily, you know, all outside air isn't necessarily fresh air, right? So what you want to make sure is that you have, you have optimized your out, the outside air that is coming in it through whatever system that you have. And uh, knowing that system and understanding that system and making sure that your facilities folks have, and we have the, a whole ventilation checklist around this, that they have adjusted the dampers and the vents to make sure that you are getting, that you're receiving outside air, that you have filtration and the, the optimal filtration in place to make sure that that increased outside air that is coming in is filtered and 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 cleaner and so and and making sure that your your air is moving you know from um, from from clean to dirty right and so you want to make sure that you are with that a again um, you are checking your system to make sure that it is bringing in, is, uh, is operating the way that it was designed to operate, which is, you know, a, a basic thing that a lot of us are not paying attention to in our schools. 
on a regular basis, but now we can't afford to not be paying attention to it. Um, so there are, there are ways to get in outside air safely um, that don't that that are uh, separate and distinct from an operable window. So one of the other questions that's been coming up is around, you know, we're looking at specialized spaces. So as we talk about the nursing stations and the sick rooms and the isolation rooms, you know, one of the things that you're going to want to have your staff looking at is negative and positive pressure. What kind of pressure that room is 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 under so that you are not recirculating into the general, you know, into the general um, air system, air that might have, that, that might be, um, ha, that might have folks who have been exposed or who may be sick. You want to make sure that those rooms are, are sucking air, not blowing air, right? And so, and these are all sort of basic ventilation steps that folks can become acquainted with through the existing materials, right? So just making sure that folks are actually going through these the checklists that we provided, going through the guidance and taking those basic steps as they make specific decisions around what to do in the face of this pandemic. Thank you so much. Um, I see that um, our superintendent, Corey Green, looks like he has, is back with us. So Corey, if you can unmute yourself, um, we'd love to hear your uh, reflections on what you've been hearing um, about the, the on the ground um, implications. Yeah, can you hear me better now? Yes, uh, I was we having can. some internet internet issues. Um, yes. Uh, first thank of all, you. I just want to thank all the pa the panelists for uh, the wealth of knowledge that's being shared today. Um, as a superintendent, obviously you can imagine, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of concern. Um, uh, there's a lot to think about uh, in terms of uh, the health and safety of our students, um, you know, considering what specific protocols, you know, we must follow uh, and implement. Uh, there's, it's, 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 very, it's very overwhelming, uh, to be honest with you, uh, and, and to also consider uh, you know, how are we going to educate kids in all this? I think one of the things we learned from the first closure of the pandemic, at least uh, from our district standpoint, uh, the number one thing that we were really focused on was staying connected with kids because uh, we want to make sure that their, you know, their social and emotional well-being um, uh, was first and foremost in, in the work that we did. And our staff did an incredible job with that. Um, you know, and, and also, you know, keeping that thought in mind for our staff as well. Um, this is a lot of change uh, for them and, and a lot of stress, uh, added stress for them and, um, and, and, you know, to keep that at the forefront. But um, I know that New York just released uh, some guidance uh, a little bit ago. Uh, and obviously, the majority of that guidance, uh, thankfully, is around the health and safety of our, our students and our staff. And and how we plan to move forward. Uh, we are going to be submitting plans to them within the next couple of weeks uh, where we will be uh, advised to uh, submit a remote learning plan, the potential for a remote learning plan, the potential for a hybrid plan, and then also uh, in school traditional setting as well. Uh, one of the things in our school district, we're about 2,000 students. I have two elementary schools and I have a middle school and a high school in our district. And we have a range of, of what I heard in terms of some of the aging buildings um, across our state, and I know other states as well. Uh, we have a building that's only a few years old that has state-of-the-art uh, technology in it, um, HVAC systems, and it, it's just incredible when you walk in that building. You can actually you can actually feel the the quality of air uh, that's in that building. Then we have other buildings that are upwards of 40 years old uh, that are in need uh, of some work as well. So. All those things need to be taken into consideration as we develop these types of plans and and move forward, uh, you know, with our entire staff. And uh, some of the things that we're doing as well as um, shifting roles when it comes to administratively, um, that having some more folks that are really just leads for health and safety of each building to make sure that we're following the guidelines and protocols and um, assessing things frequently in terms of our disinfecting and um, uh, in terms of uh, working with uh, individually with parents and, and students on, on their health and hygiene. 
thank you. It's a huge responsibility that you have and big decisions. <laughs> um, a, uh, another question um, was alcohol-based alcohol hand sanitizers on children, are they safe? You know, under uh, I think, yeah. go ahead. I was going uh, no, go ahead. I think you're better to answer yeah, that than yeah, I am. Yeah, I, I think under uh, you know, uh, adult supervision, I think they're fine with the eight right age group. You know, I think uh, uh, they work fairly well in our studies in looking at virus disease spread and, and illness reduction, they work quite effectively. If for some reason, uh, people are concerned with them. There are quaternary ammonium hand sanitizers available too. Uh, and and they, we found those to be also effective in reducing the spread of uh, uh, viruses in households and that. Um, but uh, uh, they, they seem to be pretty effective, particularly in, in the spread of uh, the viruses on children's hands and surfaces they touch. They seem to work fairly well. I don't know if you know, if a, a child comes home with a virus on his hand, within four hours, it'll be on 90% of the highly touched surfaces. Uh, but if they use a hand sanitizer just once during that time, they reduce that exposure by uh, 90%. So th they seem to be effective. But again, I, I think they should be only used under adult supervision. Um, this is Claire. Hi, I'd like to add a comment about uh, sanitizers and cleaning products. Um, most of the protocols that are going out there talk about regular cleaning and, and disinfecting uh, high-touch hard surfaces on a regular basis. This means that uh, cleaning and disinfecting products are going to be used on a daily basis throughout school buildings. For that reason, we really stress that when, whenever you can do it, you buy low odor, unscented, unfragranced products to the best of your ability uh, to reduce that because very often scented and fragranced products are um, uh, irritants for people with asthma and respiratory issues. So to the extent that you can do it in your supply chain, look for uh, unscented, fragrance-free products, uh, both for cleaning and disinfecting. Thanks. Another question, and um, Corey, I don't know if you have thoughts about this one, is um, what about if you're, it, it, like in a high school where students change classes, do you need to disinfect during that period of time between when students are in the class, or are, or would, would you ha change it and have the teachers move, but then students don't all take the same classes? So, you know, what are implications there for thoughts? Anybody, I asked Corey, but anybody that <laughs> wants to, the panel. Uh, well, I, I can step in. We've been addressing this issue more in uh, healthcare, using uh, coatings or treated surfaces that are antiviral, antimicrobial. They're allowed to be registered with EPA, but you can't really make health claims uh, on any of these products. Uh, although we see <laughs> having a reduction of uh, like, the 40% reduction in uh, health acquired infections with their use in hospitals, but they're still fairly new. Uh, and the EPA hasn't really uh, developed a procedure yet uh, for their, their registration in that. Or there are a couple of products uh, like copper surfaces uh, that have been approved in that. But I'm, I'm hoping that type of technology will uh, show to be useful in the future. In other words, you can put a coating on and it may last any. <laughs> 24 to 48 hours. Some products do have a 24 hour claim now, uh, but they're largely limited to healthcare and I don't think they're generally available right now. Another question was about like uh, plexiglass barriers between desks or in cafeteria, um, you know, whether these would be recommended, um, whether it be effective. Any, any thoughts? Okay. Yeah, this is our last question, so I've got that. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry <laughs> with that. The reason hesitation is that we don't really have any data to know how effective they are. That's why the hesitation in that. The same thing with the face shields was mentioned earlier. We don't really have good data on that, and that's why we hate. I, it's difficult to say anything. Now the face masks, yes, there is good data available. Uh, on that, so we feel more confident. The others, not to say that they might not provide some degree of detection, but we don't know how much, it, I think is what, what the hesitation. 
Well, I want to thank the panelists very much. I, I know that there's still a lot of questions and um, perhaps um, ASHA can talk about, uh, Dr. Alter can talk about uh, whether there'll be any follow-up to uh, try to answer some of the questions that we didn't get to. Thank you, Susan. I really appreciate you and your leadership today on our panel and with our presenters. And thank you all for your wonderful information. I really appreciate it. And we will do our best. We will uh, uh, try to capture these questions that we did not get to. Uh, and we'll see if our, our panelists would be um, able to address some of those and we can post them after the fact.